Thanks very much for the intro and uh, hello everybody. Uh, pleased to be here. I'm just going to talk briefly uh, about what I see as the big picture that faces us today. I think um, we're in crisis. We're facing multiple crises as a species. The uh, virus crisis is, of course, immediate. Um, we're well aware of that. The climate crisis is the far bigger one in the background that we have yet to get to grips with. But we're also facing uh, other crises, the uh, reduction of uh, space for wildlife, the, the extinction of wildlife that's coming off the back of that, and multiple human health crises at the same time. All of these have two causes, two things drive them, the use of fossil fuels and the farming of animals, particularly the intensive farming of animals. And they manifest themselves in the three big areas of life. It's in energy, transport, and food. It's about how we power ourselves, how we travel, and what we eat. And this rule of thumb that we like to use here applies to everybody individually and every organization, whatever their size. Um, an empowering part of that for me is on a personal level, it means 80% of my personal carbon footprint is driven by the things I spend money on every day. And I can start to make changes in my life. And this is a key part of our communication on this topic. But uh, big picture wise, how we get to zero carbon, how we save the world, we've got to stop using fossil fuels and stop intensive animal farming. And we have everything that we need in energy, transport and food. We have the technology. We need some behavior change and we need the uh, input of government, business and people to make the changes that we need. Take energy, for example, renewable energy is a mature mass produced form of energy uh, that's available to us now it's the cheapest form of new energy that we can have and in britain in particular we're capable of getting to 100 percent green electricity on the grid in just 10 years by 2030 we're at nearly 40 percent now it's going to be primarily wind and solar power with a smart grid which is a new way to deliver power it's an interactive thing interdependent between users and generators um, and um, in transport, we have the electrification of transport well underway. You, we can see that with cars. Um, we can see it coming with buses and with trucks and trains. And we can even see it coming with planes. Within 10 years, there will be passenger planes in the skies taking 300 people or more around about 300 miles. So we'll be able to jet across Europe, for example, uh, in a zero carbon plane. But in the meantime, and for transatlantic flights, for example, we have the possibility to make jet fuel from atmospheric carbon, synthetic jet fuel. So we can, with technology, solve our problems. We can stop using fossil fuels in these big two areas of life, energy, how we power ourselves, and transport, how we travel. And in food, it's really far more simple. We just need to stop eating animals and the intensive animal agriculture that is driving the extinction of wildlife via the reduction of habitats. And at the same time, creating the human health crises of diabetes and heart problems and cancers. And last but not least, the zoonotic virus. Coronavirus is just one of about 30 that exist in the world. It's the latest, biggest one that we face. It comes from animal agriculture. So if we wrap all of these changes up, we can get to zero carbon and solve so many problems. And although food is the simplest one to solve, it unlocks so much because if we all became plant-based for our diets, we would free up 75% of farmland in the world. We can give that back to nature. Uh, we can therefore end the extinction of wildlife and, and the pressure on habitats. And at the same time, create the most amazing carbon sinks that can help us complete the puzzle and get to become a zero carbon species. Uh, it's in our hands. Just to revert to my, uh, the, the part of the message I like the most is that energy, transport and food drive 80% of everybody's personal carbon footprint. Therefore, we get to uh, have a really big say in how that works. Businesses and governments respond to what people want. We have to show them what we want. And uh, government needs to uh, set the playing field in favor of this new way of living at the moment is prejudiced in favor of animal agriculture, fossil fuel consumption. We can change that with rules, regulations, taxes, and subsidies. Businesses respond with products and services. People, the ultimate end users, uh, are already responding and demanding change. So uh, that's my big picture. That's what the problem is. This is how we solve it. And uh, I think we're off to Q&As now.
Brilliant, Dale. Thank you so much for that and really inspiring um, information there. I, I wanted to ask you a few questions because you've touched upon several points that I know you're passionate about. Um, uh, there's, there's been a lot of talk at the moment about uh, especially energy companies going green, but the way that they talk about their figures, it, it kind of feels a bit like greenwashing. They, they talk about how green they are, but often you find out that it turns out they're using animal remains. Uh, it turns out that actually the solar and, and the wind power uh, that they're using is far lower than they, that they've said. Uh, they're talking about sort of net zero and carbon zero when that's not really the case. W what dynamic do you think needs to change within the en energy industry to hold that account um, properly, hold, hold people to account, hold companies to account? It's a difficult one, greenwashing. Um, I've, over here, we have something called a RIGO, which is a, a guarantee of origin. It's basically a birth certificate for green energy. And a lot of companies are buying energy from a coal power station and they're buying a RIGO, green energy birth certificate, putting the two together and saying, mm -hmm. this is a green energy supply, which of course is not. Uh, the real test of greenness, I think, for any energy, co energy company is, is building. You have to be spending the money from your customers' energy bills and building forms of new renewable energy, uh, which is what we do. It's the heart of our company. We call it bills into mills. We just simply take energy bills and we use them to build windmills and sunmills and, and stuff like that. Um, but otherwise, I think that it doesn't all have to come from the bottom, this change that we need to get to 100% green energy. Because if we simply change the grid so that the grid is 100% green energy, all of these issues go away. People don't have to choose it. There's no greenwashing. We're at 40% in Britain today. If we get to 100%, it's a non-issue. Yes, yeah, it's a good point. I know in the past you've said things have seemed very kind of extreme um, about uh, farming and what we could do with, with the land uh, that we're not using for cattle. I remember once you said that um, we might be able to use the grass that's left over in the UK to you know, power our homes. Where do you stand on, on that front? Because this is very forward thinking, but also things that perhaps other companies would not have even considered. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. When I talked about energy, I did mention I mentioned electricity, but not gas. And gas is really important. You know, I used to think for years as an environmentalist that we just had to give it up, that we could make green electricity, but we couldn't make green gas. But we discovered that that was that was not correct. In 2010, it became possible not just to make gas, but to scrub it up and put it into the gas grid. And uh, we went looking for a good way to make that. And traditionally, it was made with um, energy crops or food waste. And both of those have got sustainability issues. We discovered that you can make better gas with grass. And that there's enough marginal land in Britain today to make enough gas to power all 26 million homes in Britain. So green gas is a real viable thing. In Britain, it would create 75,000 jobs in the rural economy and save us uh, burning £7 billion worth of fossil fuel gas every year. So. Um, these green steps are actually really big economic steps as well. You know, the, the green industrial revolution that people talk about and the green economy, these are very real things because we'll create sustainable jobs in the process of cleaning up the air and the water and, and that kind of stuff. It's a, it's a very joined up kind of outcome. You mentioned um, in your speech about the airline industry and how we could soon see play, planes in the, in the sky that aren't emitting a massive amount of toxic uh, fuels. Uh, obviously, at the moment, the airline industry is in, in massive amounts of trouble due to the coronavirus pandemic. I mean, it seems like as it could almost be an opportunity to reset. Uh, how, how realistic do you think it is? Uh, we've seen, obviously, a drop caused by the lack of usage, uh, so, so the emissions have gone down. But, but is there an opportunity for, for the entire industry to have a sort of overhaul and, and rethink the way that they use energy in the future by becoming greener? Yeah, you'd hope so, wouldn't you? I think there'll be rationalisation in the industry for sure. And I don't think that people will return to flying at the pre-virus levels uh, you know, anytime soon because it's, it's going to be a risk for a while. Um, but I think technology is the big answer here because, you know, these electric planes are being developed by Airbus and Boeing. Um, and, you know, they both say they'll be in the skies within 10 years. I think EasyJet have committed to running European flights with them in 10 years time. So this change is coming. Um, uh, it's just what we do in the meantime, I think, that we have to look at. And it would be ideal if we didn't fly post-pandemic at the pre-pandemic levels.